up. So it is a highly interdisciplinary process or project. We, um, we work with coastal ecologists. We work with um, people who are reconstructing the ecosystem, um, and obviously archaeologists. Um, So my primary goals are to reconstruct Vista Alegre during the era of its, its most use, and of course, obviously, what we have the most archaeological data for. Um, I am a personal huge fan of public education. That is a big goal for me. I um, found archaeology a little later in my life, and I was very frustrated by the amount of information that was available to the general public. So I wanted to make every, all of my projects have something to do with educating the public, getting it out there to the public. So I come from that background of philosophy. Um, so, let's see. Again, this is, this is the group, the Proyecto Costa Escondida. It started in around 2006 with uh, Dominique Ruzzolo and Jeffrey Glover, who are both here, um, to look at the change uh, through time between these two coastal sites that were used primarily for trade, um, the associated sites of Vista Alegre and Cornille, which are about seven kilometers from each other, um, to look at how trade on the coast um, worked with the Maya. Um, so here's the site. Um, as you can tell, it's very remote. Vista Alegre is that bit that, let's see, I wonder if the, I don't want to break it again, but yes, um, this bit that looks like a thumb right here. And you can only reach it right now by boat, so it's, it's really fun to get to. I absolutely love this site. Um, so yeah, there is Cancun, there's Vista Alegre. And as you can tell, it's, uh, it, it is a mangrove forest. During the wet season, it is essentially a swamp. And um, there is Dominique Rizzolo looking very happy. <laughs> um, but all of this area, these are all the wetlands. So, it's densely tree covered, so I can't really do a lot with um, like you know drone photography. I there's there's a lot to get through, and it's very very dense tree coverage. The the site itself is in a very raw state. Um, several of the structures we've located about 33 structures over the past uh, I think since 2009, um, and a lot of them have been damaged by the frequent hurricanes that hit in this area by looting. Um, so the the condition of the site is obviously. Not ideal, very raw, so reconstruction is, um, is a challenge. I do love a challenge. Uh, let's see, so yes, this is a recent work that's been done. Um, there's been, these are the structures that have been located. This is the main pyramid, it's about 11 meters tall in this area. Um, and this is the square. We did a transect in a couple of field seasons and then it went into the buildings as a part of this operation. Um, and this is, the, uh, the dig uh, digital elevation model for that in GIS, just so you can see the difference. It's a very flat area, um, aside from, from that pyramid. Uh, so, again, some of the challenges for doing a VR reconstruction. I'm very ambitious about this project. I wanna try to show as much detail in as much time period as possible, because virtual reality obviously offers the ability to not just show a snapshot in time, but to be able to show continuous occupation, to show change through time, which is something that I think is, is one of the strong suits of it. So uh, Vista Allegra has been occupied through all of this, and most of the earlier stuff, we don't really have a lot of archaeological evidence as far as what, what the buildings would have looked like. Um, some of it may have actually been you know, torn down and used as fill for subsequent construction phases, but we do have a lot of data for primarily this area, or era. Um, another one of the challenges is there's been extreme um, ge uh, geomorphologic change in this area. Um, as you can see, this is an outline of the modern coast. Um, so this is that sort of brown area that you saw before, which has the texture of tofu. It's a very strange, we call it the dead zone. Um, so that was not there. Uh, this is during the Middle Pre-Classic, so 800 to 400 BCE, essentially. Um, so it was much larger, as you can tell, um, and it has changed quite a bit. So this is around 400 to, you know, about 1100 AD. We have, we, we know it was something along this line. Um, so yeah, again, this, it's, it's shrunk a bit, as you can tell, and then, 
that is again what it looks like now. So there's been a lot of change, and this is also something that I feel like I can show in virtual reality as well, that we can actually see you know, how the coastline has changed, what extra land could be there. Um, so we've done a lot of coastal ecology research, um, and it has, again, changed drastically. We've got a mix of animals and plants, and we actually have a lot of the details about this, and I would love to realistically reconstruct as much of this data as I can, as accurately as I can for the time periods. Um, since we have it, we might as well use it. Um, let's see. So yeah, like I was saying before, the site condition is, is less than ideal. Uh, we, a lot of the buildings, the structures are, look, look like this. This is the state that they're in. Um, we found some cool stuff that's just been like laying there, but obviously, you know, it's, it's been damaged. Um, and we have done some uh, aerial photography or um, aerial scans above the, the, the island itself, but it was more for a survey. It wasn't high resolution enough that it's anything that I could use for 3D modeling. But it does give me a good you know, terrain analysis, but it's mangrove forest, so it's very densely covered. And finally, it is a remote location. So one of the things that we want to do at, um, as one of the end deliverables of this project is we're in talks to do a museum um, with the indigenous community of Chiquila, which is about right here. It's where we set off from when we actually go visit Vista Alegre. So it's this like fishing community. A lot of tourists come there because Holbosch, which is a popular vacation spot and getting more and more popular as time goes by, is across the bay, and the only way to get over there is also by boat or ferry. So we want to set up a small museum, and that also brings up issues of sustainability, of internet access, of being able to have something that is technologically advanced, but also that we, we don't have to have an expert on site that can constantly be setting it up um, and fixing it. and you know, So that kind of rules out the, the higher end things of Oculus and all of that, because that takes a lot of processing power, and if something breaks, you know, there's, there's not a lot of experts. Um, so what I'm also very ambitious about is I'm collecting a lot of different asset types. Not only am I using um, photogrammetry to, to do individual artifacts, I'm, uh, I'm looking at excavation units. We've actually done some photogrammetric work for the excavation units, and I would love to be able to drop that into a, a model of the existing site. Um, in addition to actually showing where some of the artifacts came from in context. Uh, so this is a um, incensario head of a, uh, we, we call it a, a gopher jaguar, but it's probably a jaguar, it just has cute little gopher teeth. Um, and this is some of the work that I've been doing, getting the 3D model prepared for Blender. Because um, I use a combination of, uh, let's see, 3D modeling in Blender, dropping it into Unity for the game engine, um, and, and GIS, obviously, to make sure that it's geo-referenced so that we can reuse these, these assets that I've been creating. So, again, very ambitious, um, which is why I have Assassin's Creed up there, which, I, that is the benchmark for me. If I can have their money, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so they actually put, I, I don't know if you guys have done the Explorer version of uh, the latest Assassin's Creed, but they, uh, they set it in ancient Egypt, and they have an educational model, so they turned off all the gameplay, so you don't have to run around and kill people. You just wander around and learn about Egypt. It's, it's amazing. So I would love to use that as a model, but of course, I'm one person who doesn't have a lot of funding. Um, but these are all the things that I want to do with it. I want to have a, an existent 3D site model. I want to have it geo-referenced. I want to um, have both uh, be able to use the interpretation, like um, was talked about in a couple of talks ago, uh, for archaeologists to be able to revisit the site and actually do some of the work you know, on the site. I want to be able to have AR on the site, actually, when people do visit these Allegra. I want them to be able to go around you know, on a tablet and see you know, where the assets would have been. And remotely, I want to be able to have a virtual reality reconstruction so that we can show other students at Georgia State or wherever if we put it on the Oculus Store or the Vive once I get fin finished with it. Um, and because you can have you know, the different phases of chronology, I want to be able to represent as much of the time period of this as possible. So not just one static area of use, but change over time. Um, and then 
my end goal would be to do some sort of gamification with this involving the Maya trade system so we can actually do trading goods and, you know, driving a ship around and it, it again, I'm very ambitious <laughs> and this is, this is a master's project. Um, so I realized at that point that there's a lot of really good stuff out there that's already been done. Um, I, I base a lot of my work off of uh, University of New Mexico's Maya Arc 3D project in Copan, which is ran by uh, Jennifer Von Schwerin and uh, Heather Richards Risotto, which is, um, I believe at least Heather's here. Um, but it's, it's a fantastic project. It uses uh, WebGIS. It also has a virtual tour, sort of like a Google Street View thing to navigate the existent site. Um, they do reconstructions, they do photogrammetry, they do, they do it all, which made me feel less crazy for wanting to do it all. Um, but they, uh, they built their, their visual database and everything on the back end as, as a custom build, which means lots of coding experience, lots of computer science, and a big team. Um, plus, they're, they're quite well funded and have been working on this for a very long time. So that's, you know, under Assassin's Creed, they're kind of my benchmark. <laughs> it's my realistic version. Uh, the Maya City Builder Project is also um, loosely associated. It's run out of the uh, University of Nebraska-Lincoln. It's a programmatic Maya building reconstruction. I would highly recommend checking that out. It's fascinating. Um, and also, SciArc does some incredible uh, laser, um, laser scanning and reconstruction, and their public interface is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, you're, you're actually able to, inside of the web browser, you know, click around, change, change your orientation, look at different elements, and explore individual monuments, but it often lacks the geographic context of, of the rest of everything. Um, and two projects that I've been a part of in the Student Innovation Fellowship, which is an interdisciplinary team, are um, Unpacking Manuels and 3D Atlanta. So I'll get to Unpacking Manuels in a minute, but 3D Atlanta is this right here. We're reconstructing 1928 Atlanta um, in a Oculus-based and Vive-based um, virtual reality setting. It was started actually by archeologists who were doing a block. Um, once he left the project, it's Robert Bryant, um, it sort of became a monster. A bunch of, uh, a, a lot of people who are um, into computer graphics and artists and computer scientists ended up taking it over and it's, it's not geo-referenced, the, uh, the models themselves are sort of like almost proprietarily embedded into the, the work itself. So it's going to be, basically if we're going to go in and make any changes, we kind of have to start over. So it's been, it, I don't want to do that to myself. I don't want to get to a place where I've built all of this cool stuff and then have to completely redo it because I didn't think from the beginning about the foundation of how I want to use all of these different art, or, assets. Um, so the things that I noticed, uh, the common strategies obviously for collection are, you know, LIDAR, laser scanning, photogrammetry, and 3D modeling. Um, and the presentation strategies are website 3D viewers, like using WebGL and uh, soon A-Frame, um, Oculus by VR, and the portable, which I didn't put up here, but like Google Cardboard using your cell phone. Um, which is usually the most accessible. Um, and the common obstacles that I found were specialized equipment. So lots of time, lots of money. <coughs> none of us have that. Like, we're, none of us are very well funded for that. Um, so unique skills, which generally aren't taught, especially not to archaeologists. So we have to learn these things on our own. Um, the same thing with the presentation strategies. Almost every solution that I was looking at, I need to know how to program. And, I mean, I can do some CSS and some HTML, and I plan to learn Python, and you know, I have my dream list of things that I want to learn, but I also still have to graduate, so you know, there's only so much time, and I need to finish this at some point. Um, but yeah, again, time and money keeps coming up as the primary obstacles. So I was thinking, in relation to the 3D Atlanta project, if I could just take these assets that's been created and put them in a visual database consistent or containing all of the metadata as far as the geolocation um, and you know where basically where it was, how I created the model, and any sort of associated objects with it, such as you know photogrammetry versions, um, 
the uh, like photos, research notes, if there's some way that I can bridge all of this together in a front-end UI so that anybody can access it, I think it would really democratize things and save time and money so that I can achieve these incredibly ambitious goals. Um, so these are the multiple uses of assets, obviously. We've discussed most of them in, in here already, so I'm not gonna go through that. Um, but this is the ideal solution, which is essentially what I was talking about. We want something that can store data and metadata, something that's searchable, something that can store 3D models, which, as we know, is, is pretty difficult. Um, technology is catching up, though. I want the public to be able to get to it. Um, and obviously, for archaeologists, spatial data is incredibly important. So I don't, I don't want to basically break my foundation. So I've been looking at three different things to structure the back end of, of my, my project. Uh, first is a custom build. Oh no, I'm missing my, I, I had a 3D or a little video of 3D Atlanta, but I can show you guys that later. Um, so obviously, like I said, my arc 3D. Um, and then I was in this amazing talk where uh, Kate, I think, yeah, Kate Rogers in session 12, which was about film, mentioned interactive documentaries, which blew my mind, so I've got tons of research to do after this. Um, so, but again, that's a custom build, that's something that I would have to learn how to code and bring everything together for myself. So, two other options that I'm looking at is Hurist, which is an amazing um, database for uh, the humanities, it's basically. It's, um, uh, Ian, Ian Johnson was able to create this out of the uh, University of Australia, and it's a great data management tool. It's, it's really excellent. Um, it's open source, which I'm a huge advocate of all things open source. And the only, like, our project data is already in it as far as our back-end database, but it's not really optimized for 3D objects. So, um, and it's, it's slightly difficult to learn. I had a little bit of trouble with it. Um, the other thing, which is what pretty much everything in the Student Innovation Fellowship is shifting to, is this project called Omeka. Um, it is a digital humanities solution, and it basically creates the UI out of the database. So you go in, you enter your objects, you, um, you basically create it almost like a, a museum exhibition, and it automatically populates a front end so that you have all of your metadata there. You can click on an object, it can tell you what, uh, I think I've got an example. Yeah, so you can click on an object and you can tag it, you can have your ascension number with it, and based off of that, you can do searches. Um, and it's, again, it's, it's easy, and it's also very customizable, it's open source, and you can create a lot of um, different, you know, different things. So there's 3D viewers that you can have for it now, and you can actually do WebGL, so you can use Google Cardboard or something like that within the interface. So given the fact that it's, it's what we have at, at my library center, it's probably going to be what I end up using. Um, it's, but I would highly recommend checking it out. It's, it's got some really good qualities to it, and if you know Python and, and C++, then you're set to write your own plugins for it. Uh, so these are essentially the issues with all of these different foundations and my yeah, images still aren't showing up. Um, so I pretty much have already covered these uh, as a summary. And next steps, I'm continuing to just work on the 3D models while I work on this uh, foundational structure. And um, I would love to hear any feedback from you guys as far as any suggestions that you might have to try to use all of this data that we have in a way that makes sense.